This patient presented to our outpatient department with approximately a three to four clock hour of zonular dialysis. I'd like to share with you the challenges that I faced in managing this patient with a four clock hour of a preoperative zonular dialysis and how we overcame those challenges and achieved an optimal end result. Here's the case. Now this patient had sustained a blunt injury to his eye about a few months ago. As you can see, there is an irregular dilatation of the pupil. It seems to be some amount of an iris damage between 10 o'clock and the 12 o'clock position with irregularity and an excessive dilatation in those clock hours. You can also notice the presence of a zonular dialysis from say about 5 o'clock to about 7 o'clock, which is obvious in this level of dilatation of the pupil. Let's now move to the surgery and see what all we faced and see how we took this case forward. Whilst making the incisions, it's extremely important that we take care while creating the incisions. We do not want very narrow incisions which would result in difficult instrumentation. Neither do we want very wide incisions which would result in an unnecessary shallowing of the anterior chamber. The blue dye should be inserted into the anterior chamber in a controlled fashion. Minimum amount of blue dye just adequate to stain the anterior capsule should be injected. An excessive injection of a lot of blue dye could result in the blue dye going into the posterior segment via the zonular dialysis and this could cause a hindrance in the intraoperative period by limiting your visibility. Another way in which we can limit the blue dye from entering the posterior segment is by first inserting a cohesive or a dispersive viscoelastic in the inferior part of the anterior chamber close to the area of the zonal dialysis and then staining the anterior capsule. This is followed by the introduction of viscoelastic to deepen the anterior chamber. Please note that any residual air bubbles in the anterior chamber are going to limit your visibility whilst performing the further maneuvers which in this case would be creating of the capsular rexes. So it's extremely important to remove any air bubbles from the anterior chamber. The capsular rexes is probably one of the toughest steps in a patient with a significant sonder dialysis. This is because of the unequal equatorial forces caused by lack of zonules in the area of the zonular dialysis. As you will see, even the initiation of the capsular rexus is a little more difficult. There tends to be a significant rocking movement of the nucleus and some resistance to the pull of the anterior capsule as you proceed with the capsular rexus. The intraocular forceps at this stage when introduced by virtue of actually holding on to the torn edge of the capsule, lifting it up and pulling on it, thereby allowing the optimal propagation and final completion of the rexus makes it an invaluable tool in subluxated cataracts. It is at this point where I would consider introducing the capsule tension ring. In order to aid the ease of entry of the capsule tension ring, I introduce some dispersive viscoelastic just under the capsule to enable an easy passage of the leading eyelid into the capsular bag. We now watch the hand-on-hand -hand maneuver of the introduction of the capsule tension ring into the capsular bag. I like to use the main incision for the introduction of the CTR. This enables me use a McPherson's through the main incision to aid in the introduction of the trailing eyelid within the capsular bag. As you can see, I was unsuccessful in my first attempt. You can now see how I take the help of two Sinsky hooks, both introduced through either side bolts, which help each other in negotiating the trailing eyelid of the CTR and therefore the whole of the CTR into the capsular bag. Now, since the open end of the loop is in the area of the subluxation, the CTR is rotated a little to afford some more stability. In order to enhance the stability of the capsular bag during phacoemulsification, a decision is taken to use capsular hooks to stabilize the bag during phacoemulsification. Two stab incisions are created at the proposed site of introduction of the hooks and two hooks are now taken. And note how when they hook onto the capsular bag and pull it up and they are stabilized with the stopper, they enhance 
the stability of the capsular bag. Please note that at this point I did not have capsular hooks and therefore I've had to use iris hooks to afford this enhanced capsular bag stability. We now proceed to performing a gentle hydro dissection prior to which we decompress the anterior chamber to reduce some amount of viscoelastic. Note how following the hydro dissection, there's a prolapse of one of the poles of the nucleus into the anterior chamber. Viscoelastic is introduced into the eye and now we proceed with a low parameter, a low flow phaco emulsification procedure. The technique that I now perform is a tilt and chop. One needs to exert significant care and caution during the nucleus disassembly technique. Remember that you're dealing with a subluxated bag which is temporarily stabilized and you don't want any of the forces being applied to endanger the capsular bag any further. I'd like to work with low flow settings wherein I work with a power just adequate to emulsify the nucleus. I work with a low flow rate so that things happen in a slow controlled manner and a limited vacuum just to allow my tilt and chop to proceed comfortably. Note how each of the fragments is now further downsized and emulsified in the phaco save zone. Intermittently, however, it's important to pause the nucleus emulsification and inject some viscoelastic with the non-dominant hand with a view of protecting the corneal endothelium. During the emulsification of the last fragment, one needs to be even more careful because sometimes you may have an unduly floppy posterior capsule that can accidentally get caught in the phaco probe. I now proceed to removing the epinucleus after changing the settings on the console to the epinucleus mode. Sometimes, in order to facilitate the easy removal of the epinucleus, I use a Sinsky hook and I yank the epinucleus out of the capsular bag. This enables me aspirate the epinucleus with significant ease. Upon the completion of the epinucleus removal, I now perform a viscofluid exchange prior to the removal of the phaco probe from the eye. I then proceed to performing the bimanual irrigation aspiration. One needs to be careful because sometimes you may encounter cortex that is trapped between the equator and the CTR. And I think you need to be particularly careful when you're aspirating on the cortex in the area of the subluxation. Undue pull on the cortex and especially if it were trapped between the CTR and the equator of the bag could result in a worsening of the zonular dialysis. Sometimes I find I may need to actually hold onto the cortex and move it around to that part of the CTR which is the open eyelids to facilitate its easy removal. A viscofluid exchange is then performed prior to swapping the hands to complete the second half of the bimanual irrigation aspiration. I then move to a capsule polish mode and attempt a gentle polishing of the posterior capsule. As you can see, I was fairly unsuccessful in removing the posterior capsular plaque and therefore perform a viscofluid exchange and get the instruments out of the eye. The residual plaque is significant and in the visual axis. So I decide to use another instrument, it's a metallic round-tipped capsule polisher to facilitate the polishing of the posterior capsule. This is what you will see in this part of the video.
you will notice the ease with which the posterior capsular cells now come off the posterior capsule. We now prepare for the implantation of the three-piece IOL in the capsular bag. For this, we first enlarge the incision to 3.2 mm with a slight extension of the inner lip. I now proceed to implanting the three-piece IOL in the capsular bag. I use a Sinsky hook to afford good counter pressure whilst injecting the lens. Note how when I'm injecting the lens, the leading haptic, which often in these three-piece lenses has a mind of its own, tends to be going in a downward fashion. I turn it towards the side, I rotate it in a clockwise direction to get it in the right orientation and then inject the IOL in the eye. The trailing haptic often remains outside the eye. Before proceeding any further, one needs to confirm that the leading haptic is in the capsular bag. If it isn't, it needs to be withdrawn and negotiated so that it goes within the capsular bag. With the help of a Kuglin hook hitched at the trailing optic haptic junction, the IOL is then rotated in a downward fashion, aiming to get the trailing haptic and now the entire IOL within the capsular bag. In this case, however, I believe one of the haptics remains in the sulcus and note how I need to negotiate, rotate it around and then somehow I manage to get the entire IOL in the capsular bag. The rigidity of the haptics of a three-piece lens makes its injection rather challenging. From the point of loading it, the way in which the leading haptic actually takes its position in the cartridge first determines the way in which it's going to come out of the eye. Moreover, negotiating it from either the angle or from the sulcus into the bag comes with its own level of challenges. Note how in this particular case you've got a haptic that's actually in the angle and with the help of a Kuglin hook, I hitch onto it, draw it proximally, bend it down and release it, aiming to get it in the capsular bag and I'm successfully able to do so. Following the completion of the IOL insertion within the capsular bag, it's important to ascertain an ideal centration of the IOL. I now proceed to removal of the excessive viscoelastic from the anterior chamber. We avoid any excessive rocking movements on the IOL but just a little nudge to get the viscoelastic out from behind the eye, but look what I notice. There seems to be a strand of vitreous inferiorly. Clearly, the vitreous has gotten disturbed at the point of rotating the IOL within the capsular bag. At this point, it was one realization that I had that perhaps if I had left the capsular hooks holding on to the anterior capsule, it would have made the insertion of the IOL far less traumatic and a lot easier. Now, once you have disturbed vitreous, what do you do? The first thing you do is you release the caught vitreous. You do not pull on it because if you pulled on it, you'd cause excessive traction at the vitreous base. I release it, I bring my instruments out of the eye and then decide what has to be done with the disturbed vitreous. Note, however, in this case, upon the withdrawal of my instruments, there was a further vitreous prolapse and you can see a strand coming out towards the sideboard. Typically, a disturbed vitreous strand or a vitreous blob tends to prolapse in the area of least resistance, which is largely towards the incisions. I then proceed to planning the limited anterior vitrectomy. In order to delineate the entire extent of the vitreous disturbance, I now inject 4 mg in 0.1 ml of triamcinolone acetonide. Upon washing it out, you can clearly delineate the extent of the vitreous disturbance. This is absolutely essential prior to performing a limited anterior vitrectomy with a view of not missing any bit of disturbed vitreous remaining in the anterior chamber. We now proceed with the limited anterior vitrectomy. In order to be able to get a 20 gauge cutter comfortably into the eye, one needs to enlarge both the paracentesis incisions. The irrigation is introduced into the eye from one of the side ports and from the opposite side in this particular case, through the right side port, the vitrector is introduced into the eye and then I proceed with the anterior vitrectomy. This is what you will see in this part of the video. It's extremely important that each and every one of us 
has in our OT armamentarium a well-functioning vitrectomy unit that can be set up in a matter of minutes by the OT personnel. The settings that I use are as follows. I work with a cut rate of about 700 to 800 cuts per minute with a vacuum no more than 150 millimeters of mercury. Note how the disturbed vitreous is optimally cut. Now what signals the end of the vitrectomy and what defines that the vitreous is clearly removed is the pupil regaining its normal round shape. And to enable this, I inject some paracarpine into the eye. Do note the constriction of the pupil. I now proceed to removal of the last bit to the palocarpine and if at all there is any residual viscoelastic in the anterior chamber, only to find that there seems to be some more disturbed vitreous inferiorly. I manage this by reintroducing the vitrectomy cutter and cutting this disturbed vitreous. Whilst performing a limited anterior vitrectomy, note how the cutter just stays in its place with the cutting edge turning towards the vitreous. You never hold on the vitreous and pull on it. You keep cutting and only once the vitreous is cut and aspirated do you remove the instruments from the eye. Note the irregularly dilated pupil, possibly as a result of the trauma. This is followed by the intracameral injection of air and then we come to the last step, that is of the stromal hydration. Stromal hydration should be performed very gently and excessively forceful hydration can further disturb more vitreous. So we need to be careful and cautious all the way till the very end. This brings us to the end of the surgery. And as you can see, we had a good end result.